This is something that I feel so strong about right now. We hear many churches, many pastors, many teachers, they read from the book of Joel. They read Joel 2, and, and you'll hear, you hear it in your church pews, and they say to you, Joel 2, 28, and it will be that afterwards I will pour out my spirit on all flesh, then your sons and your daughters will prophesy, your old men will dream dreams, and your young men will see visions, even on the men servants and the maid servants. In those days, I will pour out my spirit. Then, and many times, what gets me though is we stop there. And that's the message that we give. And I believe that and I'm grateful for those words. But many times we forget to continue to the next verse and the verse after that. And I, and I believe right now today, Steve, we must continue. What does the word of God say after he says that he will pour out his spirit? What does the word of God say? What does God say will take place? This is what he says. Then... I will work wonders in the heavens and the earth, blood and fire and columns of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the great awe inspiring day of the Lord comes. He says before, let me reread that to you. Listen to that before the great and awe inspiring day of the Lord comes. And it will be that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved for on Mount Zion and in Jerusalem, there will be deliverance as the Lord has said, and among the survivors whom the Lord calls. But Steve, I want you, I think it's so important. And this is part of our discussion this morning that we were saying, why does the church leave out that the sun and the moon will, will go grow darkened? I want you to speak to that. Well, I have an answer for that. Number one, the reason why most churches won't do it is a matter of economics. The big churches, the mega churches need a certain money uh, income flow. And one of the things that most people don't understand is the last words of Jesus and the continual words of Jesus and, and Matthew 24, Luke 21, and then all of the inferences to the last days in the New Testament culminating in the book of Revelation echo the Old Testament prophets. The reason why they won't is they believe that if they speak a soft message, that it won't turn away people because people become milk cows. I'm sorry to say that. One of the things I think you guys would really be blessed with too is to have like Pastor David Langford on. He was a Church of God guy that preached, taught, pre-tribulation rapture, that's standard cog or Church of God beliefs. And then God got a hold of him after 40 days of fasting. He's the only guy I know in my life who's ever done, I think, three 40-day fasts. The man's disciplined. He can quote the scripture exactly like Jack Van Impey. But there's an anointing. You need, and, and I'm saying this, and Marcella, you and I talked about this. It's the anointing that breaks the chains, okay? Every one of us has chains on our brains. That rhymes. We have chains in our heart. We have a set of scales in our where we weigh everything in our mind, and we have a set of scales in our heart. God has tipped the scales in redemption. God has tipped the scales in our favor. He's given us everything that pertains unto life and godliness, but he promises us this. Behold, I give you power to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt us. The devil's number one deception is to keep Christians from recognizing their authority, and number two is to keep them from uh, manifesting that authority. Because in essence, the reason why the devil has run just free and clear, hypersonic level, is because there's been no challenge to him. The scripture says when the enemy comes in like a flood, the spirit of the Lord raises up a standard against him. And that's what we're talking about right now. And I think it's critical, it's absolutely critical necessary for our well-being to basically have that anointing. And I think, too, you know, again, I think that the, the here's the thing. You can't transfer what you don't own. You can't transfer the, the transference of spirits. And, and Moses did it to Joshua, Caleb. The Lord literally told him, take of the spirit that's on you, Moses, and put it on them. The anointing, Elijah's mantle transferred to Elisha. The thing that I think is critical is this, 
you can't just talk about the Holy Spirit. It has to be demonstrated. The word of knowledge, the word of wisdom, those are miraculous gifts of the Holy Ghost. And Lori, you probably remember, I remember, Mondo, you remember, and Marcella, you remember, the neatest things of, of, in my opinion, okay, and I'm an old rock and roll guy, but the bottom line <laughs> is, is I love the old hymns. There's power in the blood. There's power in the blood. Trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus than to trust and obey. A mighty fortress is our God, and on and on. And so what was What's interesting is this, the gratefulness in our hearts has gone because the majesty of Almighty God, the glory of his redemption in our lives, we've allowed the church, quote, and I'm not talking about the true body of Christ, church meaning ecclesia, the called out ones, we've allowed the world to influence us and, and to basically emasculate the men and denigrate the women rather than to take our authority and walk forward in the blood of the Lamb. And so this is what I'm really trying to say, you guys. The anointing will break the chains. The anointing will break the feather, uh, the, the fetters. In other words, the anointing breaks everything that binds us. And Jesus' last words are, be ye not, see that you be not deceived. Deception is all around us. And Jesus said, if it were possible, even the elect would be deceived. 